was in France a couple months back teaching. <clears throat> and toward the end of my stay, I was waiting in front of a hotel to be taken to a Vipassana group in, in Paris to, to teach. And I suddenly realized this was my first time in France without a translator nearby. And the thought occurred to me, what if someone asked me a question? And sure enough, there was a telephone line worker on the, working with the crew on the street across, across the street. He saw me and he came over and he said, marvelous, marvelous, you're just the person I want to see. I've got this miserable job, I'm surrounded by dishonest people. Does Buddhism make you happy? <laughs> and I said, yes. He said, how does it do that? Okay. And so I talked about generosity and virtue, and this is all very you know, pidgin French and for me. Um, generosity, virtue, meditation. How do you meditate? And so I said, we have a website. <laughs> <laughs> so I gave him the, the address. And so he shook my hand. And the irony of all this was that I was on my way to the center to give a talk on the topic that I'm going to talk about today, which is that the present moment is not the goal of the practice. And so when I got there, <coughs> I mentioned the story to the, to the people in the, room, in the room. And I said, you know, if I had told him that you could be happy simply by accepting the present moment, accepting your miserable job, accepting your dishonest friends, he would have walked away. He would have had good sense. Fortunately, that is not the message that the Buddha teaches. When the Buddha does talk about being in the present moment, he never says to just hang out in the present moment, be fully present to the present moment. It's always in the context of death contemplation. Death could happen at any time, and there are duties that have to be done. And if you don't do them now, they're not going to get done. So today I'd like to talk a little bit about what these duties are in the present moment and where they actually aim. We focus on the present moment because we are creating suffering in the present moment and we want to learn how to stop. And it comes from our actions and so it's important to understand the Buddhist take on what are exactly are we doing in the present moment and how does that shape our experience. Um, when the Buddha described his teaching as what kind of teaching he gave to distinguish it from other teachings that were available in India at the time, he, call, he called it Gama Wadi, which means a teaching or a doctrine of karma. Now, we may have heard that everybody in India believed in karma and rebirth. That's not the case. It was a controversial topic. Um, and there were some people who taught there was no rebirth. The people who taught there was no karma, or there is karma, but it has no effect on your life. Some people taught both karma and rebirth, but they said, well, if karma doesn't affect your rebirth. You just get reborn willy-nilly, um, depending on fate or the will of a creator god. And so the Buddha, in calling himself a karma wadden, was basically making two points. That the karma is real and it also is effective. Um, but he also differed himself from other teachers who taught, taught karma. Particularly there was a group called the Nigantas. So they were the forerunners of the Jains. And the two points of difference in the way the Buddhism taught karma, and the Buddha taught karma, and the way the Jains did, how your present karma shaped the role of present karma in shaping the present moment. That was one difference. And the second, of which kind of karma is most effective, physical or mental? Um, the Jains basically said, your present moment experience is totally shaped by the past. You simply have to accept the fact that you're being presented by this experience and you accept the experience. If you want to speed up the end of your time here in samsara, you undergo austerities in order to bring on basically more painful karma so you can burn off your old past bad karma. And that was basically their teaching on karma. The, we tend to think of the Buddha as being very, very polite, very gentle. But when he talks about the Jains, he tends to ridicule them. Uh, he went, one time went to visit some Jains. And it's interesting that the Buddha was not the kind of person to go out and pick fights. But he did go and confront the Jains and said, do you really teach karma like this? That you, know, it's, that you cannot shape your present moment with your present actions? And they said, yeah. Um, and these austerities that you do, have you ever noticed that when you're doing austerities, you have pain, right? Have you ever noticed when you stop doing the austerities, you don't have pain? <laughs> In other words, what you're doing right now has a big impact on the extent to which you're going to suffer. The other difference, of course, was that he taught that it's your mental karma that is the most important, because after all, it's through your intentions that you decide to do various things. 
And so this is why we meditate, focusing on the present moment. It's because our present moment actions are shaping our experience of pleasure and pain in the present moment. We want to see how, why it is that we're creating suffering. Now, nobody wants to create suffering, and yet we keep doing it again and again. So we have to look into why is it we're doing this. Um, so in focusing on the present moment, focusing on the mind in the present moment, the Dharma teaches us, one, what to accept. I mean, there are influences coming in from the past. We can't go back and change our past karma. But we also have the ability to do something about this raw material coming in from the past. We're actually taking the raw material provided by past actions and shaping it into our present experience. So we have a choice in how we're going to shape that material. And that's something also we have to accept, that we are playing a role in this. So we have to look in to see what is that role that we're playing. So the kind of things the Buddha tells us not to accept in addition to uh, what we're doing that's unskillful. He says he, he doesn't accept a lazy and defeatist attitude. Suffering does have a source, but it doesn't really come from your past actions. It comes from what you're doing right now. And the teacher's duty, from the Buddha's point of view, is to give you a, a basis for deciding what you should and should not be doing in the present moment. Um, this reflects the na active nature of the mind that we are constantly doing things in the present moment. So his, his role as a teacher is to give us some guidance and what are some good choices to make here in the present moment. When he would start people out, he would start them talk, thinking about what, what he later called the practice of merit. In other words, being generous, being virtuous, learning to meditate to get, your, to, get to know your own mind. So that you can see that you can take an active role in shaping your life for the better. As I told the telephone line worker, you know, try to be generous, try to be more virtuous, try to meditate. These things will give you a handle on how you can stop suffering so much from the present moment. But as you do this, you begin to get some insight into the fact that even skillful present karma is something that constantly needs to be done. There is no point you ever have enough good karma in the present moment. You're constantly having to shape the present moment. Um, this is why the present moment is a part, can be a part of a path, but it's not the goal. It's like a house that's constantly under construction. You know that house down in San Jose that never finished? <laughs> well, this, your house is different because your house is constantly falling down and it has to constantly be re repaired and put back together again. And in the Buddhism, image, it's not only falling apart, but it's also burning. It's burning with suffering. So you can't just stay in the present moment and say, okay, I'll learn how to accept the fact that I'm burning. The Buddha says there is a way out. In preparation for my trip to France, I got online and uh, was watching this program called Sagesse Bouddhiste. It's a, can you imagine the United States having a, a weekly TV program where they interviewed a Buddhist teacher? They had that in France. And um, I was amazed to discover, you know, when you're struggling to learn a language and then you hear garbage in the language, it's kind of frustrating. <laughs> There was a lot of garbage on Sajjas Buddhist. There was this one teacher on there one time who was saying, the whole purpose of the practice is to learn how to accept things as they are, that you can't really do anything about going against the, 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 the way of nature. And happiness lies in acceptance. And uh, the interviewer, who was a very, normally a very gentle and sort of welcoming and um, sort of motherly-like character, got curious. She said, well, isn't that defeatist and pessimistic? And the woman being interviewed said, only if you think about it. <laughs> well, the Buddha is not the sort of person to tell you to stop thinking. He says, your, your suffering is what makes you think to begin with. I mean, if we didn't suffer, we wouldn't need to think, right? Mm -hmm. But it's the fact that we're suffering. We've got to think, and th think, think things out. And the Buddha says, okay, learn how to think skillfully. When you look at the images of the Buddha that gives of people who are on the path, there's never the image of somebody sort of sitting back and just accepting. It's always images of people who are searching, people who are engaged in battle, people who are trying to develop a skill. In other words, trying to learn how to be more skillful in how they shape the present moment. And he actually calls, calls the um, Eightfold Noble Path the unexcelled victory in battle. So there's, there's a battle to be won and there's work to be done. And so that's why when the Buddha is talking about being in the present moment or focusing on the present moment, it's in the context of realizing there is, there is a battle that's going on. It can be won. Uh, you don't have, have much time. You have to do it, so you better focus on right now. There's one famous poem in Majjhima 131. 
starts out saying this, you shouldn't chase after the past or place expectations on the future. What is past is left behind, the future is as yet unreached. Whatever quality is present, you clearly see right there, right there, not taken in, unshaken. That's how you develop the heart. Okay, so focus on it. Then, ardently doing your duty today for who knows tomorrow death. There is no bargaining with death and its mighty horde. So, th this concept of there's a duty that should be done. In the other um, suttas where the Buddha focus, has you focus on the present moment, there was one case where he told the monks that sh they should practice heedfulness and think about death frequently. And one monk says, I think about death once a day. The other monk says, I think about it twice a day. <laughs> Third one, I think about it four times a day. And then it goes shorter and shorter periods of time. Finally, you get to two monks. One says, while I'm eating my food, I think, may I live for as long as it takes to chew this morsel of food. I can do good things in the practice. Another monk says, may I live long enough to finish this breath. I can accomplish great things in this practice. And the Buddha says, OK, those last two monks are heedful. Everybody else is heedless. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not that you are just being in the present moment. There's something to be done in the present moment. And the Buddha gives you an, an, another example where he says, every night, and this is when you're, you're thinking of death twice a day, um, every night when the sun sets, you remind yourself, I could die tonight. Am I ready to go? Are there any qualities in my mind that would make it difficult for me to let go? And if so, work on, focus on working on those qualities abandoning those causes of suffering. The same thing in the morning when the sun rises. This could be my last sunrise. I could die today. And he gives a list of various ways where it's very easy to die in the course of a day. And then he says, am I ready to go? If not, there's work I've got to do right now. These duties that the Buddha is referring to here, of course, are the duties that come under the Four Noble Truths. There is suffering. Okay, what is the suffering? You want to comprehend it. Now, comprehending means understanding it totally to the point of dispassion toward it. We tend not to think that we're passionate for our suffering, but there are a lot of things we do that create suffering, but we just hold on to them. We say, the suffering doesn't matter. I'm, I, this is something I've got to do or I want to do. And the Buddha wants you to look carefully at that. Do you see, okay, you're doing this, you're causing yourself suffering. Is it worth doing it? That's the duty with the, regard to the first noble truth. The second noble truth is the cause of suffering, and that's something should, which is craving. That should be abandoned. When you see the cause of, of suffering, that's when that's what you let go. Now, most of us get these duties confused. We try to let go of the suffering. You know, we're clinging to something. We say, "Well, let go." Well, first you understand what what induced you to cling to begin with. What was the desire that you had? That's what you let go of. Otherwise, it's like going into a house, seeing the house is filled with smoke, and you put out the smoke. As long as you keep putting out the smoke, it's not going to stop. You've got to find where is the fire put out the fire, and then you're done. The duty with the third noble truth, which is the cessation of suffering, is to realize it. And that's basically realizing the points when, when you finally do let go of the craving. First, as you see this in moments, when you let go of a crave, particular craving, there is a moment where the suffering ceases. But the Buddha says, ultimately, there, is, there ultimately is a point where you stop the craving entirely. And that's the end of the suffering. You have dispassion for it. For it. So you try to realize that. And then there's a path. The path is to be developed. All the factors from right view up through right concentrations are things that you work on. Now, as you work on following these duties, you find more detail in exactly what's going on here in the present moment. The Buddha describes this in some of the steps in Dependent Core Arising. There are a lot of steps that come prior to sensory contact, and even prior to sensory consciousness. If you look at the list, I mean, half of them come prior to just the fact that you know a sight hits you or a sound comes to you. You're already working to create suffering for yourself. Or if you do this, these processes with knowledge, you're actually creating a path so that no matter what comes in through your senses, you're not going to suffer. So you, have, you want to look at what is it that you bring to the present moment. Um, and the Buddha talks about the process of fabrication. We fabricate what he calls the five aggregates, the aggregates of form, which is your sense of your body, feeling, feeling tones of pleasure, pain, neither pleasure nor pain. Perceptions, which are the labels and images that you use to communicate with well, this is this and that's that. Um, kind of like instant text messaging in your mind. Um, fabrications are where you put thoughts together, and then consciousness is the act of, of knowing or being aware. 
All these things, the Buddha says, are fabricated. In fact, they are fabricated from your potentials. And we do them for the sake of something. When we're in the present moment, we don't just sit in the present moment. We're fabricating these things for a particular purpose. So the arrow of time is already embedded right there in the present moment. Sometimes you hear people saying, well, you get into the present moment, you step out of time. It's not the case. In the present moment, you are still fo fashioning things for the sake of something, usually your hope for happiness. Even when you manage just to be the knowing in the present, you're fabricating that consciousness aggregate and taking on an identity with it. What this shows, of course, is that the mind is active. In other words, we're not just passively accepting contact coming in. We are out there, we're usually looking for trouble, but we're out there looking for something. Which is why the Buddha has us look for the causes of suffering inside, rather than say, saying to him, let's, go, let's change the world outside and people will stop suffering. You have to say, well, what is it everybody is bringing to the present moment? That's why they're suffering. In fact, what we bring to the present moment actually comes prior to our experience of old karma. It's interesting. New karma is our immediate experience. The results of old karma that would come in through the senses come afterwards. So this, these things include the way we talk to ourselves, the images we create. They have a more immediate reality for us than the events we can even get through the senses. So you have to focus on the fact that the present moment is something that is under construction and it's moving through time. Um, you get some people saying, well, I'm going to hang out in the present moment. I'm not going to care about what the results are of my practice. There's some schools of meditation that actually pride themselves saying that our school of meditation has no purpose at all. Um, that we just sit in the present moment to, as, as part of our showing lack of concern for the future. Um, but you're turning a blind eye to the fact that you are creating causes for the future by the way you interact with your, interact with your present moment. Now, just as the mind is proactive in its engagement in the present moment, there is a proactive role for the path in shaping your present aggregates. Right resolve, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. These are all purposeful activities. With right resolve, you make up your mind, I am not going to act in ways that are based on sensuality, based on ill will, based on the intention to harm somebody. Right effort, of course, you generate the desire to do what is skillful. You generate the desire to abandon what is unskillful. Concentration, of course, you make up your mind, you're going to stay with one object. And even mindfulness is proactive, the way the Buddha taught it. It's not just accepting the present moment, it's realizing what's coming up in the present moment and then saying, okay, what needs to be done with this so I can shape it in a skillful direction so I can get the mind into concentration. You learn about the process of fabrication by doing it skillfully. Um, think about the Army Corps of Engineers. You know, they've, they've had to keep the Mississippi River from breaking out and creating a new mouth which it has, in the past, it's done fairly regularly. It just kind of moves. It, it silts up, silts up, silts up, and then it moves. And they figure out if it moved, you know, lost, New Orleans would die. And so they've been putting levees along it and creating all, the, all kinds of things to keep the Mississippi going in its path. They've learned an awful lot about the Mississippi River in doing that. Things they would never learn otherwise. Another example you can give is if you want to know how strong the currents of a river are, you build a dam across the river. And then, then what may seem like a placid river suddenly shows some resistance. And so it's by ag actively engaging the present moment through the path that you begin to see how deeply this process of fabrication goes. Even what we would tend to think as relatively passive qualities in the practice have their role within this proactive context. Things like equanimity, patience, and contentment. The equanimity the Buddha teaches is not the equanimity of someone who says, I don't care, I'm, I don't really do, nothing really matters to me. It's more like the equanimity of a doctor. You think about the equanimity in the Brahma Viharas. It has to be practiced together with goodwill, compassion, empathetic joy. You don't just be equanimous on its own. You've got to develop these other qualities. And so they say a doctor has a patient who has some symptoms that cannot be cured. The doctor has to be equanimous toward that part that cannot be cured, so he or she can focus on what can be done, where the patient can be helped. And the Buddha, when he talks about the practice of equanimity in, the pra in meditation, he says you have to w watch out for having too much equanimity because it leads to stagnation. It has to be practiced together with a sense of effort, also with a practice of concentration. The image he gives is a gold 
goldsmith. The goldsmith has to put the gold in the fire for a while, then has to take it out and examine it, blow it on it to cool it off. If he just examines it without, cool, without putting it in the fire or blowing on it, it just sits there. Nothing happens to the gold. If he just puts it in the fire, the fire burns. If he cools it off, and then nothing, nothing again, nothing would happen. It's the combination of those three things, effort, concentration, and equanimity, that allows the goal to develop, and in the case, same way with your mind. Um, so th when you're developing equanimity, it has to be in the context of goodwill, that you want to see good results coming. And there, there are certain things that are not going to happen, so you don't focus your efforts there. You learn how to focus your efforts on the places where they will make a difference. As for patience, the Buddha teaches the patience of a warrior. In other words, there will be setbacks in the battle, but you don't let yourself get upset by that. You say, okay, there may be an opening, I'll wait for the next chance, um, which is motivated by your desire for victory. When the Buddha talks about patience, he basically deals with two types of problems that come up in life. One is harsh words, and the other is physical pains. Um, with harsh words, he has you remind yourself that this is the nature of human speech. There is kind speech, there is unkind speech, there is ill ill-meaning speech, and there's well-meaning speech, there's true speech, there's false speech, there's gentle speech, there's harsh speech. When someone is speaking to you in unskillful ways, it is not something new. It's not something out of the ordinary. This is the way human speech tends to be. Um, and then he has you reflect even further. If someone's, someone is saying something really nasty, you, you tell yourself, an unpleasant contact has made, an unpleasant sound has made contact at the ear. Now, how many times have you told yourself that? <laughs> now, he says, let it stop right there. Okay. But we tend to pull it in, and we make lots of, lots of stories about it. It's like we're taking those words and we're stabbing ourselves with them. Um, and as for physical pains, the Buddha says, okay, you learn how to develop a sense of pleasure through the meditation, so you have an alternative place for your mind to go. This is why that when the Buddha talks about working with the breath, there's a lot about developing pleasure, developing rapture, breathing in a way that pr provides you with, with sensations that calm the mind, so that you have an alternative place. So you're not totally um, overcome by the pain. So the patience here is not just accepting things. It means there are certain setbacks I have to accept, but I accept it for the, f for the sake of looking for the opening when I can do something positive. So there are many images in the canon, as I said, of the patience of a warrior. As for contentment, the Buddha teaches contentment with external conditions. In other words, food, clothing, shelter, medicine. It's a, if it's enough to practice, you've got enough. What you do not content yourself with is the level of skill in your mind. Um, this is shown in what the Buddha teaches a teaching called the customs of the noble ones. The first three have to do with being content with food, clothing, and shelter. And the Buddha says you have to watch out to make sure that you don't get worked up about times when you don't get you what you want. And on the other side, you don't pride yourself that I'm able to do without things that other people cannot do without. That's, that's a danger. Um, as for the fourth of the customs of the noble ones, you think of the first three deal with food, clothing, and shelter. The fourth one would be medicine, but it's not. It's learning how to delight in developing and to delight in abandoning. In other words, Delight in developing skillful qualities in the mind. Delight in abandoning unskillful qualities in the mind. And these are areas where, where the Buddha said, it, you cannot just rest content. If you see yourself creating suffering, you don't say, okay, that's okay, I'll be calm. Um, I've had some students tell me, said, well, don't push me so fast. You know, it's going to take me a while to learn to become more skillful. And they said, do you ha it's not that I'm trying to push you, but it's the fact that, you know, how much time do you have left? We don't know. So you have to motivate yourself to say, I cannot rest content with unskillful qualities. In fact, the Buddha said that was the secret to his awakening, was he didn't let himself rest content with whatever level of skill he had. And you see that in, in practicing, there is a sense of discontent that drives the path. After all, we are suffering. We don't want to just sit around in the suffering. And this is what motivates you to develop the path. And ultimately develop you know, what the Buddha called the heart of the path, which is right concentration. You're able to get the mind in a good steady state. Um, it's called jhana because it's related to the verb jayati, which is for a fire to burn in a steady flame. You're trying to get your mind to be really steady because there's a sense of pleasure there. 
and a sense of well-being. And also the stability of the mind allows you to see things in your mind that you wouldn't have seen otherwise. In particular, you see that even the state of getting the mind in concentration is a kind of fabrication. You know, you've got the form of the body, you've got the aggregates, all, all your aggregates are here, you've got the feeling of pleasure, you've got the perception that holds you with the breath, you've got the fabrication of yourself talking to you about how to settle in with the breath, and then finally there's the awareness of all these things. So even this is fabricated. So you use these fabrications in order to pull away your attention, uh, attachment to other things, and finally you have to realize that okay, this too is fabricated. This is where the other meaning of that verb jayati comes in. In other words, even the, even the state of concentration, which is very, real, very calm and very steady, is burning as well. And it's when you develop a sense of dispassion for that too, that's when you go outside of the present moment into something that's not fabricated. And this is where you have your first taste of the deathless. Um, there is no fabrication there in us, so that, that state of the deathless, which is basically outside of time, it's not done for the sake of anything, it's just there, it's present. There is a kind of pleasure, but it's not a feeling. There is a kind of consciousness, but it's not one of the it's part of the aggregate of consciousness. So this is, how, this is what the practice is aimed at, is getting to the state that is outside of space and time, outside of the present moment. When you come back from that first experience, you return to the processes of fabrication as before. But you have a big difference. You've seen that there is something deathless that can be touched by the mind. There was an awareness there, but it had nothing to do with any of the aggregates. There was no fabrication involved. So you don't identify with the, with the aggregates anymore. You have no doubts about the Buddha's teachings about the existence of this timeless dimension. And <clears throat> you realize that what kept you from experiencing that was all the unskillful fabrication you've been doing up to that point. And so you resolve, that you're, you know, you resolve not to fabricate in unskillful ways again. Um, so that's where we're aimed, which is to look into the present moment to see even the best present moment is fabricated and to gain some dispassion for that. It's through to the dispassion that our experience of the present will separate, will, will cease. Um, and that's just the first taste. Now, this may seem far away, but there are implications for us here and now. One, it helps, these teachings help, help us know what to do with the present moment. We don't just enter into the present moment to stay there. We don't resign ourselves to it or to any momentary pleasures. There's an image you often see of the, you learn how to sit like a person sitting on a shore watching the waves come in and whatever waves come in are perfectly okay. Big waves, small waves, whatever. And we're not resigned to that position. The Buddha's image, of course, is one of going across a river to safety on the other side. You're not being asked to turn a blind eye to the limitations of staying where you are. The, you know, the telephone rot line worker with his miserable job and his dishonest friends, he doesn't have to just accept that. The Buddha said there's something better that we can find, not by lowering our expectations for happiness, but actually raising them to, through developing skills. So this way we learn what to accept, accept things that are coming in from the past karma that cannot be changed. What not to accept, we don't accept a lazy attitude, we don't accept, accept a defeatist attitude. We realize that we can make the pre present moment into a better place. This is through the practice of merit. Now here in the West we don't like the word merit, it sounds too much like brownie points and, and Boy Scout points. Perhaps a better translation for the word punya would be goodness. I mean, doing our, developing our goodness as best we can. That too, however, is a word that doesn't get much press in the West. Um, I don't get online often, but I d did get on one time and I got into Amazon, and just for the fun of it, I stopped, started typing in, typing in words into the, into the search box like honesty, wisdom, discernment. I got to goodness. Goodness was mainly books on um, baked goods. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I think it's time for us to sort of pick up the word goodness and shake it off and clean it up and put it into practice. I mean, you, you do make the present moment a better place by the goodness that you do. We can free ourselves from bad influences from the past. As I said, the Buddha said, there are, are skillful ways of dealing with unpleasant contact coming in from the past so you don't have to suffer from it. He talks about developing the Prabhupada Viharas, developing your wisdom, your virtue. Learn, learn how to train the mind so that it is not overcome by pleasure and not overcome by pain. So that 
when bad contact comes in from the past, we don't have to just sit there and say, okay, I'm just going to be miserable because of this. I can develop a state of mind, which is much more expansive. One of the images he gives of this is the difference of someone is being fined for having stolen a goat. If a poor person is fined for having stolen a goat, he usually doesn't have the money to pay it off, so he gets thrown in jail. If a rich person steals the goat, the rich person has plenty of money. He can buy off the judges. <laughs> It's an image we don't like, but <laughs> but you can, you know, you have a lot of wealth with which you can counteract the influences from the past. At the same time, by engaging in the present moment in a more skillful way, we create better conditions for the future. And also, we're not stuck here. We're not stuck in this house. The house is constantly burning. You, you can't stop it from burning. But the Buddha says there is a fire escape, and so we look for the fire escape through the practice. And that way we get out, ultimately there is a freedom that is non-flammable, that will not burn us. And it's outside of past, present, and future entirely. And because it's outside of time, it's not going to be touched by anything. Once you've gained it, you've gained it for good. So that if, you know, if I'd been able to explain things in French to the telephone line worker, that's what I would have set him down to tell him about. So, um, are there any questions? Yes. Would you elaborate on what you just said about once you have it, you have it? Um, I appreciate that. There's not much to say. <laughs> I mean, the Buddha talks about different stages in, in, in the awakening process at different levels. But for you know, for the arahant, it's there for, you know, I mean, because you're outside of space and time, then it's the, there's no question about forever or not forever. It's just you're outside entirely. The Buddha does describe nirvana. He uses lots of different um, analogies and <coughs> images to describe nirvana. And they fall into five major classes. One is that it is true. In other words, it's not going to change. He calls it permanent, the unchanging the true. It's also bliss. Um, there is, it is a state of consciousness. He calls it consciousness without surface. The image they have in the canon is of a light beam that's coming through a window of a house. And if it's, say it's coming, the sun rises, the light beam from the sun is coming in, it's going to hit their western wall. The Buddha says, what if, what if there's no western wall? Then it's going to land on the ground. What if there's no ground? It's going to land on the water. What if there's no water? It doesn't land. And he said, the image of the light beam that doesn't land, that's the image of the consciousness of this, of this, of this state. Of this state. Um, let's see, so we have truth, bliss, consciousness, oh, what is something else? freedom. That you're freed from your defilements, you're freed from suffering, you're freed from all kinds of limitations. And then finally, that it's excellent, it's really, really good. <laughs> So those are the kinds of epithets that the Buddha would use to describe this. Yes. Can you explain why you call it a battle when you first began to speak? That sounds violent. Well, <laughs> sometimes your greed, aversion, and delusion get pretty pretty obstreperous, and they say, I don't want to do this. I'd rather hold on to this, hold on to that, and they have all kinds of reasons. And so it's not just, it's just, not just a bloody battle. Sometimes it's a battle of wits. Sometimes it's a battle of... Um, you, you have to think strategically, let's put it that way. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, hello, this is a practice question. Mm -hmm. Um, I've been practicing for some time, um, but when I um, pay attention to my breath, um, I start to, I, I try really hard not to control it, but I, I start to yawn, mm -hmm. and then sometimes I'll sigh, and I, I may even gasp for breath a little bit. Mm -hmm. And the usual advice I get is just don't meditate on the breath, it doesn't work for you. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know if that's what I should do, or if that's what I need to, to work on. Um, okay, you can try relaxing before you focus on the breath. 
In other words, there's some things you may do before the breath. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One thing I found that is really helpful is you sit and you meditate and you think about where are the bones in my body? You start with the bones in the tips of your fingers. Yeah. And you feel, okay, where do I feel the tips of my fingers right now? Is there any tension there? Allow it to relax. Then move up to the next joint. And then the next. And the next. And the next. Up, 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 up the arm. And then start with the toes. You know, the, the final joints of your toes. And work up the feet, up the, up, up the legs, uh -huh. the pelvis, the spine. And we've got everything kind of calmed down that way. Then it's like, okay, let's look at the breath now. Okay, so you recommend I, I keep working at trying to to be with the breath instead yeah. of giving up. Okay, thank yeah. you very much. And it's, I mean, there, there's, there's some, probably some energy issues in your body that you need to work on. Yeah. Yeah. A question over here. Yeah, I, I have a question also around the practice of, um, it's kind of like the battle, I, as I understand it, and that is with um, certain mind states, like anger or, um, um, like yesterday, I was actually in a state of mind where it was so, the thoughts were so intrusive. Mm -hmm. And I would bring myself back. Um, but again, right, this commentary within me, a part of me just really, which ultimately generates more and more anger, mm -hmm. right? And so, uh, ultimately, I I thought um, uh, it was about fear. Underneath the anger, there was fear of mm -hmm. being in trouble. Mm -hmm. And and then once I realized there was fear of being in trouble, um, in acknowledging that, um, something shifted. Right, something gave space, and ultimately I wasn't sure what it was, whether it was a phone call that came through, whether it was that I had washed my face and uh, somebody had plucked my eyebrows and there was a lot of pain in that, so my mind generated a different focus and it had let go temporarily from that. Mm -hmm. But that's, um, I also noticed that when anger comes to me, I get consumed by it. Mm -hmm. And it's something that is just so, it's like possessed, a certain amount of possession by this feeling. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, certainly there is lots of layers to it. And my question, you know, since we're in the quest of, since I like to learn more about suffering, uh, I, your talk is so rich. <laughs> I mean, it's so rich. It seems like the, a lot of the answers are seen there, but mm -hmm. how to become skillful mm -hmm. and to just working on this, you know, just this particular part. Okay, um, you have to take the anger part. As I said, you're, you're fabricating your present moment. And it's, the Buddha says there are basically three types of fabrication that are involved there. There's bodily fabrication, which is the way you're breathing. There's verbal fabrication, the way you're talking to yourself. And there's mental fabrication, which are the perceptions, the images, and, and, your, and, your, and the feeling tones. And so you can ask yourself, okay, my anger is, has, has hijacked my breath. It's hijacked my mental conversation. It has hijacked even the images I'm using in my mind. I've got to take these things back. And so you start with the breath. Say, okay, breathe, breathe calmly. And the part of the mind that says, no, 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 I don't want you to be angry. No, I said, no, 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 I'm, I've got to breathe calmly right now. And then you're going to ask yourself, what are the images that are driving this? It's kind of, they're kind of flashing through the mind. Can I consciously replace them with alternative images? And for example, you're dealing with your boss and you have this, you know, there's, a, there's a, you know, an image of some monster movie that comes out and flashes. You say, no, the boss is not a monster and the boss is a human being. <laughs> um, and as you replace that image with a human being image and then Part of your mind will resist, but you say, no, I've got, I've got to hold on to this. And then start talking to yourself. It's like, okay, do I want to follow through with this anger? And part of the mind will say yes, part of the mind will say no. This is where the image of having the mind as a committee is useful. You know, some members of the committee have taken over it, and I've got to go back and I've got to bring the conversation back to where I want it. And that way, if you start seeing the mind as a committee, there's no sense that I'm, I'm, you know, my mind is overwhelmed by this, I've got to give in. Okay, I can, I can take my, my faction of the committee 
and strengthen it. And then be able to, whichever other members of the mind I can convert, I'll convert them, and the ones I can't convert, I'll throw out the wall. And that way you, you, you learn more about the anger by resisting it. Like the, the image I gave of the dam across the river. You don't know how strong the river is until you've put a dam across. And you're going to learn a lot about exactly what it is about the anger that has an allure for you, why there's part of the mind that wants to go to the anger. And then you begin to see that a lot of those reasons are weak. And then, then that's when you begin to get free of it. So try that. Thank you. Yes. And thinking about anger, um, so usually when I'm angry, it's to a person or a group of people. Mm -hmm. And so what I often do is do metta for them. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if this is, if you think this is a f more effective or less than, you know, like examining it in some deeper okay, way. Okay, this is kind of like a good way of cutting across the, the what I call the verbal fabrication. That's saying the thing, so and so is a bastard, so and so really deserves to be impeached. I mean, that, that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and you say, wait, a minute, let's have a little bit of compassion for this person. Let's have a little bit of goodwill. That changes the conversation. Um, but it's sometimes you can't bring yourself to even feel goodwill, right? And the Buddha has, has the. Um, sort of the knee-jerk reaction, which is, if I act on my anger, I'm going to do something stupid, and this person is going to be pleased to do, see me somebody do something stupid. Do I want to please that? <laughs> <laughs> so whatever works. I mean, it's, you have to give these things a karate chop to begin with. And then you stop and think, you say, well, is it really good for me to let myself be consumed by, by my anger? No. Have some goodwill for yourself. But also learn how, you've got to understand your mind if you're going to overcome these things. Simply spreading a nice sort of pink haze around the world is not going to get to the root of why did you like the anger to begin with? Which part of the committee liked the anger and was, was a, found it appealing, enjoyed engaging in the anger? And when you see that, then you can get beyond it. Um, the word rich for what you're saying mm -hmm. has, is absolutely true. <laughs> You've given us so much wisdom here. Um, I'm trying to break some of it down. Um, what, what do you, how do you speak to self-sabotage in practice as coming from the past? Okay, again, that's just one of the voices in the committee. That's partly is afraid of what you're doing, if you're practicing. If it wants to be more comfortable in its old, old ways of doing things and, doesn't, and it feels unstable in, in a new environment like that. Okay. And so you have to ask yourself, okay, which part of me wants to sabotage the practice? Or which part of me wants to sabotage my happiness? Um, see if you kind of trace it out. Why would I go for that? And there, there's usually a sense of, if I'm not too much is expected of me, then I'll be okay. So you might ask, ask is, that, is that what's going on in the mind? Um, just sort of ask questions about what the Buddha says. You, when, when something like that happens, you want to see what sparks it. And then once it's come, why does it go away? And when, then, when, then when it goes away, why do I pick it up again? And keep coming back to it. Because these things have their lifespan, but yet we dig them up again and again and again. And in the course of watching yourself digging it up, you may see, well, this has a certain allure. There's something about this that really I find attractive. And many times self-sabotage is just that. If, no, if my expectations for myself are lower, then I won't feel challenged. Or I won't, or I won't get embarrassment, then I won't have the embarrassment of failure. Um, th these are some of the things that might be, might be playing on there. And then when you can see the, the allure, then you can compare them, well, these are the drawbacks of falling for that. Is it worth it? And you, when you really see why it was you went for it, and then you can see that it's not worth it, then you can let it go. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Please raise your hand. 
feels like there is a, a child inside, an adult and parent, kind of. Mm -hmm. And our child wants to be heard. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like the method uh, you're suggesting is like uh, to a child. Um, I don't know how. It's like parents saying, be quiet, you know, mm -hmm. and that's not going to work. No. So no. do this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there is that part that wants to be heard. It feels like a, a little child in us. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering how to deal with that. There, oh, maybe always will come back until it's really heard mm -hmm. and thoroughly kind of feeling like being understood. Mm -hmm. And so you'll come, you know, up and up and up again until it's really heard, yeah. the child in us. So I'm wondering how. You need a wise parent. That. You need a wise parent. In other words, and again, what are, the, what are the shoulds that this parent is trying to impose on the child? And you might think, well, let's try the Buddhist shoulds, which are, you should try to understand why you're suffering. You should try to understand if you can let go of this, the cause and reason with the child and not just say, you just got to do what I tell you because they're going to tell you what to do it. You say, there's, there are reasons for this why you will be happy if you, you know. Your child should understand. <laughs> <laughs> Feels like male and female. No, no, don't, 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 don't think of it that way. Think about it. Your, your adult is a mother. Your parent is a mother and says, look, I don't want you to be miserable. And this, this, this is going to be good for you. And, and I, I, I understand your problems, but at the same time, you, we, we have to learn to not let the child run the committee. <laughs> It wants to be heard. I know, it wants to be heard. Let it be heard, and then they say, "Okay, we've heard you. You know, thank you for sharing. <laughs> but this will actually be good for you in the long run." I mean, it's the kind of parent that that beats the child down. That's that's why the child feels, "I have never been heard. I haven't been treated properly." But if the parent says, "Look, it's reasonable to say there are certain ways of acting that are going to make you happy. Certain ways of acting that are, that in the long term are not going to make you happy." So you've got to start, start, start thinking long term. How, how much more time do we have? Okay. I just have a short question. Did the Buddha uh, recommend the students rec uh, meditate on death? The meditation on death is basically d d designed to make you realize how little time you have. You don't know how much time you have, so make advantage of it right now. That's, that's the purpose. It's for it is to make you heedful and to give you more encouragement to say, okay, I really do have to do this work in the present moment. That's the kind of meditation. Great. Thank you. Okay. In the back. So we're more uh, really motivated to practice towards the deathless. That's, mm -hmm. you know, straight line. And we're trying to prioritize... Uh, retreat practice, practice more in everyday life, jhana practice, wisdom practice. You know, the Buddha has many different practices, the Brahma Viharas. Mm -hmm. Is there um, some way to be more efficient knowing we don't have much time, knowing death is coming? Okay. Is there, is there a, this, you know, a way Buddha had to plan, you know, our time towards different practices? I would say... Get, get to know your breath really well and then work on, work on the qualities that say, like I've, to keep you mindful, keep you balanced in, in a sense of solidity in the present moment so that when unskillful things come up, you're not knocked off by them, that you learn how to deal with them. And for this bodily fabrication I was talking about, learning how to breath, work with the breath in a way that's comfortable. Um, you can... They, they, they keep mentioning my books and being accessed to insight. They're actually more, more on dhammatalks.org. Um, going to dhammatalks.org, there's a book called um, Each and Every Breath, With Each and Every Breath. And that talks about breath meditation and also integrating breath meditation into your daily life. There's also some over there. There's some copies over there, okay. Yeah. 
That sounds like that's very much a Bay Area question now. <laughs> so. But yeah, and also, you know, in, in terms of your job, you know, how much, how far do you need to go in the corporate ladder? And how much is, is, is when you work, work, work your way up, are you actually going to give yourself less and less and less time to actually practice? There comes a point where you say, look, I've got enough in terms of where my career is. Now I can focus more, more time on, on what I really need to do. No, any, nobody at death ever regrets spending too much, too, too little time at the office. <laughs> <laughs> Else? You have a question? Um, so I think people have. Mm -hmm. uh, people have talked about um, you know the anger, and it, it does feel like battle when you deal with anger. Mm -hmm. But I think when you would say the word anger, battle, there's a lot in it about. Better like a wits, right? And I think um, when it comes to say having to deal with ignorance, or I think another topic, essential pleasure, is uh, I feel like it's a lot more about like bettering with bettering with wits, mm -hmm. because I've always have a really hard time telling my friends about like the say the um, the dangers of in essential pleasure, mm -hmm. and I've, I I don't, I don't feel like I ever su really succeed in like convincing them that it's oh it's not good for you for example. Well, well not all sensual pleasures are, good, are bad for you. You have to look at if you, in, if you indulge in a particular pleasure, what happens to your mind? What is your motivation for in, indulging it to begin with? And if it's unskillful in either way, then you say okay this is something I have to avoid. Now you're battling Madison Avenue. I mean, the, our whole, cu whole culture has been cultivated on the idea that you know, give in to your desires, give in to your, obey your thirst. Remember that commercial? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. And so it's going to, it's, there's a lot in our culture that goes against that. And people who deny their sensual pleasures, they're twisted. And if you saw the film The Demons, this, this shows that I'm a monk and my references to films or films were back in the 70s. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it had you know, Vanessa Redgrave and Oliver. Oliver Reed, and Vanessa Redgrave's first appearance, she's coming in, she's a nun, and she's got her head twisted off to the side. And I went there with my girlfriend, and we said, we know where this movie's going, we don't need to see this, we left. Um, so you're battling against a lot of a very strong tendency in our culture. Basically, say they're, they're, don't say sensual pleasures, period, are bad. Just say there are certain sensual indulgences that are going to be bad for you, you've got to watch out for them. And be very careful. But you also have to give people an alternative. This is why we meditate. Learn how to meditate in a way that is pleasant. So you have an alternative pleasure to go to. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing that. And I think it's I already I really appreciate it when I have to deal with my own, you know, like uh, when sexual pleasure come up and it's it's not the pleasure that's the problem, right? It's like when we have say we cling to it, and then we have intentions of doing bad things because of that. The bad things uh, you do to get it, and then the, the impact yeah. it's going to have on your mind. Yeah. Because uh, so you can I, say, I don't cling, I don't cling, I don't cling, but it has a bad impact yeah. on your mind. Yes. And then, uh, it's very difficult to look through that. Yeah. Um, would, would you like to say something more about, say, the problem with uh, ignorance? And I think one of the things that's very core of the practice is Understanding the, the concept of self, not self, uh, like the, the identity behind. We have one minute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <yes. laughs> For self, look at the book called Selves and Not Self. Yeah. Um, yes. For the self issue. I mean, the issue about sensuality, the pleasures themselves, it, the question is. What is my motivation for indulging in this? And when I do indulge in it, what kind of impact am I having on myself and other people? Those are things you've got to watch out for. And it's, the Buddha says the big, the big culprit is our fascination with thinking about sensual pleasures and embroidering them to make them more than they actually are. I mean, all those techniques that Madison Avenue uses on us, the mind uses on itself all the time. 
planning a pleasure, reflecting on the pleasure, how great it was, writing, writing restaurant reviews and writing them over and over and over and over and over again. Uh, that's the problem. To work on that. Thank you very much for your uh, share. sharing. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. We're done? Okay. Thank you for your attention.